Thanks for listening to the GOSH podcast. GOSH stands for the Gynecologic Oncology Sharing Hub, an open space for real and evidence-based discussions on gynecologic cancers. We'll share the stories of gyne cancer patients and survivors and hear from researchers and clinicians who are working behind the scenes to improve the lives of people with gynecologic cancers. Our podcast is produced and recorded on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. It is produced by the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative, a province-wide initiative in British Columbia with the mission to accelerate transformative research and translational practice on the prevention, detection, treatment, and survivorship of gynecologic cancers. Hi, I'm Nicole Kay. And I'm Stephanie Lam. And you're listening to the GOSH podcast. Hi, I'm Elmira Jantuyakova. I do behind the scenes work for the GOSH podcast. Today, I'll take over Stephanie and Nicole's place as a host, and you're listening to the GOSH podcast. So welcome back to the GOSH podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Paul Young. He's a distinguished gynecologist directing the research program at the BC Women's Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis. Um, Dr. Young's clinical focus line lies in pelvic pain with particular expertise um, in endometriosis, painful periods, sexual pain, and associated bladder, bowel, and musculoskeletal um, issues. Dr. Young's commitment extends to the academic realm, uh, where he serves as an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia, Department of OBGYN. His translational research endeavors include spearheading biobanking initiatives for endometriosis, conducting gene sequencing studies to unravel underlying mechanisms and investigating nerve formations in pelvis as potential source of pain. Beyond his clinical and research roles, Dr. Yang actively contributes to medical education, impairing his no- imparting his knowledge and experience to the next generation healthcare professionals. His multifaceted approach underscores a holistic commitment to advancing the understanding and treatment of pelvic pain and endometriosis. So welcome, Dr. Yang. Thanks for um, joining us today. Um, Thank you for having me. uh, We have, I wanted to start um, with a couple of sort of clinical questions that we came up with our previous guest, Anna, Anna Leonova. Um, about sort of clinical presentations and some symptoms um, about endometriosis. Um, So first question, how do you diagnose endometriosis? Well, historically that largely dependent on, it was largely dependent on having surgery. So laparoscopic surgery Mm. and then seeing endometriosis tissue at the time of surgery and then sending that tissue to the pathologist for histopathological confirmation. Mm -hmm. Uh, But now it's recognized that there um, are actually a myriad of other ways that endometriosis can be diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So there can be a clinical diagnosis based on history and examination. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are certain findings and examination that are actually uh, quite predictive. Mm -hmm. And there's also been a lot of advances um, with imaging, so ultrasound and MRI, Mm -hmm. uh, that could actually, uh, some types of endometriosis can be diagnosed quite accurately as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, these, there's these, these different ways of diagnosing endometriosis. Mm-hmm. And I think um, ultimately it's up to the, the individual patients and the care provider to decide the, what means of diagnosis is most valuable or most useful to that person at that point in their life. So mm-hmm. for, for one person, it might be a clinical diagnosis on history and examination is all that's needed. It has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then for another person, uh, a surgical diagnosis with pathology confirmation might be very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we just try to, to personalize it to each, each situation. Mm-hmm. I see. It's, it's good to hear that there are options, like the more invasive and less invasive ones. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Um, and you mentioned history. I was wondering if there is a fam- like relationship between family history and endometriosis at all. So I think it's like other multifactorial conditions where there's a partial genetic component, but it's not like a single gene disorder, uh, mm-hmm. but it's it, there's a, it's it's like currently there's several dozen SNPs in the genome that have been reproducibly associated with inherited risk of endometriosis. So there is some inherited component, but there's there's other factors as well. Mm-hmm. 
I see. And does endometriosis affect fertility? So in, in some individuals have more difficulty conceiving, mm. um, others don't. And mm. sometimes it's um, more evident why. So the more anatomically severe endometriosis, which can, it mm. uh, correlates to the staging at surgery. So it captures things like the amount of endometriosis, uh, adhesions, stuff like that. Those patients tend to have more dif more likely to have difficulty conceiving. Um, so that that I think it's more obvious why. Um, but in other cases, um, other cases of endometriosis, you can have the exact same endometriosis lesions, and one person is able to conceive quite easily, and the other person is not. Um, and uh, there is, you know, there's still a lot of work remains to be done on why. It's a, a, the exact same thing with pain. You have the exact same endometriosis lesions in two different patients. One patient might have no pain and endometriosis is just noted incidentally at the time of another surgery, while another patient has severe pain. And again, you know, the research question is why is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And now that you mentioned that the pain as a symptom and um, we talked about fertility, uh, there are some questions regarding about like if pregnancy will affect endometriosis, especially endometriosis, like alleviate the pain symptoms. Um, is it true at all? Well, I think perhaps historically there was uh, maybe generalizations made that endometriosis will perhaps always get better during pregnancy or be better afterwards. But I think it's recognized now that that's not the case and there's a lot of variability. So you might very well have an individual whose endometriosis symptoms are better during pregnancy because they're not having menstrual periods if their pain is very dependent on, on that factor. And then postpartum, they notice their, their symptoms are better. All the way to another individual um, who uh, might have symptoms actually even during pregnancy. And I've seen that in two branches. The first branch is patients that have endometriosis that has um, developed into chronic pain and that chronic pain can be exacerbated during pregnancy. Um, and also patients who have the anatomically severe types of endometriosis, like deep endometriosis, so those sometimes can still cause symptoms during pregnancy. So th there's those two scenarios. And then similarly, postpartum studies sh uh, now show it's, it's about 50-50. So about 50% might report being better still, while another 50% will report this just recurrence of symptoms again. So um, a lot of uh, heterogeneity for sure. Mm, yeah, a lot of variation, it seems like. Um, and continuing about the pain, does endometriosis stage affect the pain symptoms? So I think most people recognize that there is a marginal correlation between surgical stage or the amount of endometriosis and the pain symptoms. And that seems to be because endometriosis uh, may predispose an individual to develop other causes of pain. And then those other causes of pain then confound the association between stage and, um, and uh, pain symptoms. But I think if you do really well controlled studies and adjust for these other pain confounders, um, there are probably some elements of stage that are, are still important. Like one study was done of a thousand patients of endometriosis and found that with a big enough sample size, you, and they, they tried to remove individuals that had other pain causes, they were able to detect an association between a, a deep endometriosis, which is an invasive subtype, in a particular location of the pelvis at the near the top of the vagina, um, that being associated with deep pain during sexual activity. And so that anatomically completely makes sense. Uh, but you wouldn't detect those type of associations if you're not don't have a big enough sample size and you're not controlling for other factors. Mm, yeah, and we're gonna talk about the sample size, how sometimes it can be hard to get the, the necessary materials for the research, but um, going on about the clinical sort of management of endometriosis, what are the treatment, common treatment strategies for endometriosis? So um, it can be divided, I guess, into medical, surgical or um, interdisciplinary. And uh, medical treatments um, involve anti-inflammatories. 
um, which are not just empirical. There, there seems to there probably has some pathophysiological effect because there's a relationship relationship between the COX uh, enzyme and um, uh, estrogen metabolism in the endometriosis lesions and endometriosis being an estrogen dependent disease. So if you use an anti-inflammatory to inhibit the COX enzyme, you in theory at least are gonna be affecting estrogen metabolism and reducing it. So um, in theory, it, it, it is a, a, a treatment, but uh, I think in research studies and also clinically, find many patients, it does. It only offers a partial response. And then the other treatments are various hormonal treatments that um, essentially um, uh, aim to reduce estrogen level um, in the lesions themselves. So they have local effects in the lesions themselves and also uh, systemically because endometriosis lesions not only produce their own estrogen, um, but uh, by kind of grabbing uh, metabolites uh, from the sy uh, systemically and then using them to produce estrogen, but they also utilize um, estrogen produced from the ovaries essentially um, and to sort of survive. So if you, hormonal therapy aims to address both the sources of estrogen and there's a variety of different ways. And then surgically, uh, they are, most surgeries are done laparoscopically and then you visualize the endometriosis lesions and then you attempt to excise um, lesions um, as much as possible, ideally to a uh, complete, what seems visually at least to be a complete excision of the disease. And then um, it's been, again, as I mentioned, endometriosis seems to predispose to other pain comorbidities. And that's where an interdisciplinary uh, approach to pain is important. And for, at our center, that includes things like uh, physical therapy, uh, counseling, psychological type therapies, and um, not saying the pain is in someone's mind, uh, but we know from a, a biopsychosocial understanding of pain that really the best approach to treat pain is, is a holistic approach. And then uh, also a foundational element of what we offer at our center is pain neuroscience education. So um, just uh, education about uh, how pain is generated in the human body and how the brain and the spinal cord are involved in that there's some plasticity there. So um, uh, you can kind of remodel the nervous system um, uh, to help reduce pain as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are options and there is holistic approaches usually necessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a couple more last questions about like a clinical presentation. Uh, will endometriosis lead to ovarian cancer? Uh, well, in most cases, no, uh, but there is a small, slightly increased risk of um, uh, endometriosis-associated ovarian cancer. So, for example, endometrioid and clear cell. Uh, but the, the, there is a statistically a slightly elevated risk, but the, the vast majority of patients with endometriosis will not de develop ovarian cancer. But, of course, the important research question is for those minority of, individu of individuals that do develop ovarian cancer, um, how do you find those individuals, I know, which are from a small number of a disease that has a prevalence of one in 10. So how do you find that small number that are at risk to develop these endometriosis associated ovarian cancers? And then how can you intervene to try to prevent it? So, well, I'd say for the vast majority of endometriosis patients, it's not an issue. for for the smaller number that it does become an issue, it's a really important issue uh, in terms of uh, pre preventing uh, future cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, and of course, yeah, so as we mentioned, um, endometriosis can be debilitating for patients uh, and some people even, um, we've, we've, I've heard some questions about, it, about the disability for a patient's uh, like, uh, if people can apply for disability with endometriosis diagnosis in Canada, are you aware of such cases at all? I don't know the answer to that question, but mm -hmm. for sure, you know, every patient we see with at our center, we ask about impact on quality of life, day-to-day -day activities, social activities, work. And there, I don't think there's any doubt that endometriosis can have a major impact in all those elements, uh, but I can't speak specifically to that, to that question. Okay, sounds good. I think we are more or less done with our clinical okay. sort of questions, but we still have some more research related questions sure. um, about your research program. Um, 
So just maybe we can start up by talking about your translational research projects in your lab and what kind of projects are ongoing currently um, in your lab. Sure. So um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our research program is closely related to our clinical center and the foundations of the research program are an endometriosis registry and then uh, biobanking of uh, uh, endometriosis tissue samples for those that undergo surgery. So those two elements are the core foundation. And then um, the research is also guided by our patient research advisory board. Uh, so we have patient partners that uh, you know, inform the research as well. Um, so two things uh, on the lab side that we're interested in. So uh, the first is um, the role of nerve I guess hyper innervation around endometriosis lesions. It's been called hyper innervation. It's been called, been called neurogenesis. Um, it's also been called neuroproliferation. But you seem to have some patients with endometriosis where their um, their lesions of uh, so the the ectopic endometrial epithelium and stroma are surrounded by this increased number of nerve endings. And so we're trying to characterize you know, why is that the case and uh, what are the clinical implications of that. And then is, does that present a uh, potential uh, therapeutic target um, in terms of um, endometriosis or the immune system uh, signaling to uh, cause this hyper innervation or neurogenesis or neuroproliferation? So that's one part of it. And the other part uh, where we collaborate with uh, GCI members. So we published previously with Dr. Anglizio and Dr. Huntsman. So that's looking at somatic cancer driver mutations in endometriosis specifically in the epithelium. Uh, the reason is that endometriosis, while benign in the uh, no, vast majority of cases, um, even in those benign situations, it has um, can, some subtypes have tumor-like qualities, so benign tumor-like qualities. So that's the deep endometriosis subtype, the ovarian endometrioma subtype. And so that it can be locally invasive, proliferative, can grow. And so we hypothesize that these uh, somatic gene mutations that are present in cancers might also be present in endometriosis, and they 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 are, and they're actually fairly prevalent. And then we've found so far that these um, mutations are more likely to be present in those types of endometriosis, which are more invasive, or or it's like the deep endometriosis or the ovarian endometrioma. So it's possible um, that that may be playing a role in this more aggressive uh, type of disease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. And what about um, the current challenges that are faced by uh, researchers in this field? And what are your um, thoughts on how to overcome those challenges? Well, I think like many areas, spe uh, specifically in women's health research, um, you know, is the needing more funding, of course, for, for research. So I think that's, that's, that's important. Um, secondly is um, uh, more national collaboration between different endometriosis centers. So I think we're, we're uh, slowly getting there. So uh, CIHR recently funded a, a uh, it was a project grant from McMaster to look at non-invasive diagnosis of endometriosis through the use of a biomarker. And that was a collaboration between multiple sites in Canada. So hopefully we'll get more of that. And we're hoping one day to have like a, a national registry for endometriosis, similar to what we've done here provincially. So that's that's a second thing. And then a third thing I think is more um, uh, supportive research infrastructure, I guess. So we had a, a guest speaker come here recently from uh, Dr. Andrew Horn from Edinburgh, uh, talking about uh, their clinical trial program there for endometriosis. And it was really remarkable to see the amount um, of support they have for clinical trials in this area, both at the federal level, but also in terms of a local clinical trial unit. And I think that they are able to leverage that to, to do a lot of exciting work on innovative non-hormonal medical therapies of endometriosis. So I think that's something I'm hoping in the future for women's health research in general uh, to have more of that infrastructure. And then I think um, some areas are further ahead than others. So I think gynecological cancers are probably ahead of other groups. And so we know there's an opportunity to learn from those, those groups as well in terms of how they become successful in this area. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely an opportunity to grow and 
form the international collaborations in the space of endometriosis. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your insights and answering our questions. And I think that was our last question. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you again for joining us today. And it was uh, Dr. Paul Young. Um, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining us on the GOSH podcast.